No, no, but can you just go, uh, can you just copy this? Uh, open Paris okay? Yeah, so just say uh, uppercase O, 1, S, H. I, I can do it. All right. Uh, it's you.tv and this is the link. Oh, were you presenting from this? Now we've got to change that as well, right? Oh, so now that laptop will become the primary. It will yeah. broadcast from that laptop. Yeah. We want to. Yeah, but if you, yeah, if you change now, the link will change. Yeah, the link already changed. This is the, this is the link. This is a new link. Yeah. Okay. I'll put that up. DSDWHB. O one search. Setting up something. Yes, yeah, yeah. Wait. We're trying to get this. It's not zero. It's O. Caps. Yeah. DSDW. Yeah. Yeah. All caps? No, no, no. DSDW is lower. It may not matter. URL caps are lower. Yeah. HD. Yeah. HD. Yeah. So I think it is what? Uh, YouTube or DSDW. Yeah, you have to put it. You have to put it. Perfect. So why are we not able to watch it? I can see it. Muted, yeah, you can unmute that, then I don't have to use this maybe. Hello? Yeah. Right? Hello? 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 Yeah, it's good. You can ask them. Can someone in the online confirm that you can hear us? Can someone online? Can give a thumbs up if you can hear us. Yeah, yeah, 
Okay, perfect. Can yes. we have everybody seated, please? Going once. Can we have everybody seated, please? <laughs> or just do clap, clap once. <laughs> yeah. Or I'm going to start singing. You don't want that. Please. <laughs> Okay, our next session is going to be a panel discussion. We have uh, four panelists. I'm going to invite each one of them. Vinay Balasubramanian from BSPES. And I'm going to let them explain what BSPES means. Vinay Balasubramanian is passionate about using knowledge based learning as means for progress of society at large. For the past six years, he's been engaged with an NGO, Bhagavati Sarla Polyval Education Society, so there, there you go, with the primary mission of bringing social and financial independence to the third child in rural Uttar Pradesh. Along with education, he's involved in other initiatives such as health and hygiene, community development projects. He's a software architect by profession. The next one is Amit Polyval, also from BSPES. Amit Paliwal supports girls' education and employment with focus on gender equality for girls. He is an active board member of NGO Bhagavati Sarla Paliwal Education Society since a long time, with a mission of promoting girl child education and equal rights. He is a software engineer by profession as well. We have a pattern here. So, Chalam Palikat Sikshana Foundation. Welcome. Chalam, I'm hoping I'm not butchering your last name, Tarjan. Okay, so Mr. Chalam is the COO of Sikshana and launched Sikshana's government partnership model. Prior to Sikshana, Chalam headed the international consumer gift card business for Amazon.com and was a volunteer with Ashra for Education with the Washington, D.C. and London chapters. Uh, our own Srijan Chakrabarti. Um, from Asha for Education. He's going to moderate the session. Um, Srijan has been a volunteer for Asha Seattle since 2003 and had taken up different roles within the chapter, including treasurer and chapter coordinator. After working as a software engineer for nine years, he left his job for full time non profit work and earned a degree in Master of Social Work from the University of Washington. Currently, he directs a non-profit in Seattle with a mission of increasing food security locally. So, give a big round of applause for the panelists. I think if you can speak and maybe the online can hear you guys without the echo, but you can have it in the back of the Okay, yeah, that's good. Again, uh, one more big uh, applause for our panel here. Thanks for being here. I'm going to keep the discussion fairly open, so we'll give a chance. I have a handy and list of questions that we had prepared. Uh, so I'm going to give everyone a chance to kind of explain their work in the first uh, part. And hopefully we'll leave some time for questions and answers. Uh, so I would request you to keep the first part close enough, short enough, so that we can spend more time doing more interactive questions. So with that, maybe I will the first question, which is like generally give a brief background of your work and your involvement uh, for both organizations. So let me start with Chalam. Hi, everyone. <coughs> Sorry. So uh, Shikshana Foundation was actually founded in about 98 or so. So it's, uh, and I say or so because there are multiple definitions of when we launch. So uh, we're, at some point we get that figured out. That's a, we call that a second priority if we get there one day. Uh, in, the, in the meantime, our focus as an organization is on student motivation to learn, right? What we mean by that is there are a lot of organizations that are working on what we call the supply side of the problem, which is, you know, are the, do we have enough teachers, school infrastructure, um, you know, it, it, do we have the right policies, uh, do we have the right teaching methods, and so on and so forth, right? Uh, what we want to do is we want to focus on the demand side of the problem, right? Who is consuming this? Who is at the center of, uh, if we thought of a customer in this relationship, who is the customer? And there are multiple definitions of this, and I don't want to, uh, I don't want to state it as if there's only one definition of the customer, but in my view, the customer here 
is the student. Now, if we, and then again, there are other folks who would say that this customer is a parent, the customer is a teacher, and so on and so forth. But we look, we come to all of that later. But that's our definition is that the customer is a student. So we work backwards from there. We say, what gets the student motivated about coming to school, about engaging in school, uh, about taking charge of their learning? I think so. Those are the three pieces. So we start with doing things like offering rewards and incentives. So we'll give these uh, non-financial rewards. These are these shiny star-shaped badges. Kids like shiny things. They start showing up for school. Uh, and they start showing up for school, and then they start engaging in school. So we start giving these badges for attempting, for trying, for participating. So, and that's the key. That's the key point of difference. It's not for achieving, right? So, when, so and the kids know that they can just get this by showing up regularly. They know they can get this by asking a question in class. They can get this by trying to answer a question in class. Uh, they can get this for we give out these booklets and we for just completing some of these booklets and so on and so forth. So, so what we want to reward is effort, right? So that's that's the first thing. Then the second part of it is is then building a culture or building the school out as a zone of success and a zone of support rather than a zone of failure. And the way we do that is by offering by creating a peer network. So uh, you have students and we, we create what we call a student club, and then we have these leaders, uh, and then the, the student leaders are basically pushing their peers in the class uh, to, to get some of these tasks completed. Uh, and at the same time, provides our act actually a support handbook so that if the student has a question, they don't have to approach the teacher about it or a parent can certainly approach the leader. But we also highly encourage students to leverage everyone in their network, <coughs> everyone in their network to learn. And, and that's something that we just keep pointing out all the time. So it, it just goes into you building out that support structure and that social network in the school so that kids feel motivated about doing this. And this is something that should be very familiar to us in Asha because I mean I, I think a lot of us at least started out uh, viewing Asha as a social network, right? And and we came here and then of course and, and I'm not saying everyone got here with that approach, but I, I do know personally a lot of people who came with that approach. And it's kind of similar and it keeps a certain amount of sustaining it has a certain sustainability built into it. And that and what that means is rather than giving out these financial incentives or other incentives You've got a mechanism where the student wants to come to school regularly, and, and almost it gets disappointed when they can't make it. Right. So that's the social network piece of it, and then there's a third level of it, which is basically starting to provide some structure. You've got this kid fired up; they want to learn math, etc. Now, what what kind of structure do they have? Um, at the moment, it is you know the, the way the pedagogy is laid out very often is is that hey, here's one way to do this. And then here are some exercises, and I'm going to go start it out, right? And then they're introduced uh, at, in a common framework, so which means if I'm taking a class on algebra, if I'm going to start out, all of you are going to start with me right now, regardless of whether or not you're ready for it, right? So the, the idea then is, is from our side is to say, no, look, different students are going to learn in different grades. I think this is a well accepted notion, and we've got Khan Academy saying the same thing, and so on and so forth. So this is not news, right? Except that there hasn't been a framework to do this in an offline space, right? Where you're not having kids sit in front of a computer and doing these things. So a couple of different things we've said is we want to have students consume in bite sizes. So we create these small booklets so they can complete and have a sense of accomplishment for completing those booklets. Then we also basically say uh, for every concept that we're going to introduce, uh, particularly math, we're going to present that concept in at least three different ways of solving that, that issue. Right, and, and and in that way, what the, what the student is basically getting is, hey, there's no one right way. You can come at this problem from multiple different directions, and maybe one of them works better for you than the other. Right, um, and then and what that allows them to do is start making progress on the concept and not feel like, hey, okay, I just don't get this, or I'm just stupid, or whatever it is. Right, so this and basically, as they start making progress, as they start completing these booklets. Uh, they're also able to start getting what we uh, get these stickers or what we call a learning map. So it's kind of a progress indicator. So think of it as a jigsaw puzzle, but many of the pieces miss. So that's what they get at the beginning of the year. And as they learn each new concept, they get one more piece of that jigsaw puzzle and then they build it up over the year. And then their goal, of course, is to complete it. Now, this is a very tangible way of explaining to a child as to what they need to accomplish by the end of the year, versus saying A, B, or whatever, providing them a letter grade or a numerical grade. And this is also something we find to be very motivating. 
I mean, in the end, as, as we go through all of this, what's the end state that we're looking for? So to me, it's a, this kind of, kind of comes back to the question, what does student motivation look like in the end state when you get what you want? So for this, uh, I think the most, uh, the most vivid example I have in my head is um, when I visited this school in Anikal. So this Anikal is this block near uh, Bangalore. And uh, this, this is a school where Dell has a technology program that the Dell is sponsoring this technology program, and that and Shikshin is the operational partner. We're gathering it, we dealt with the current and we're gathering, we're gathering it on the ground. And so we get to the school, this is about uh, 9 o'clock in the morning, school's open at about 10, 10 30, right? And this particular school is about 10 30, it varies a little bit, right? And so we get there about 9 o'clock in the morning, mostly because we want to see what happens before school starts, right? And school, the students often just congregate before school starts, they, they often play, or they're doing other things, whatever they're doing, right? Um, and, and in this particular case, we get there, uh, we, the, the tech program is such that there are about five tablets uh, that the students have to share across four classes, right? This is classes uh, four, five, six, seven. And, um, and, and so the students have prepared for themselves, the student leaders have prepared a schedule for how the kids will share it, right? right? So it's not the teachers are getting in and, and deciding that. The students have decided what that schedule will look like. This girl had, was, this was, it was her turn to get it, right? It, nine o'clock came, she was there on the dot, right? 9.15, uh, you know, they're basically the student leader isn't here yet to open the cupboard and give her the tablet. She's getting antsy, she's getting her digging, right? Uh, 9.20, the student leader comes in, right? And this girl is basically going, what's going on? Why are you, where are you, where have you been? I mean, this is, it's, I, my turn starts at nine o'clock. Right? You make sure that at the end of this, I get my full one hour. This is what's due to me, you make sure that I get that, right? And, and so this is, this is the modem. This is the modem that she's operating. Then she gets the tablet, and then she opens the tablet, she knows exactly what she's doing. She's not, she's not using it for fun or whatever it is. And then, by the way, we totally don't, don't prescribe what the kids should use it for. Go ahead, if you want to play a game, go, go ahead and play a game, no issues there, right? But this girl basically opens up this English app that uh, she's been practicing on. She skips multiple sections. Now, I, at this point, I don't know why she's skipping these sections. She just skips these sections, right? And then she gets to this other section, and then she starts playing this game. And it's, it's, a, it's a gamified uh, way to teach English, right? So she starts playing this game, and she's terrible at it. I, I don't understand what she enjoys so much about this, but she's really, it just feels almost masochistic, right? That, uh, she just keeps going, uh, the score's not going anywhere, she fails, okay, then she starts again, and then skips the other sections, comes here, and then plays this again. And then, uh, and then basically, I just observed this for a while, so I was just wondering, you know, I, I asked her, so what are you learning? And then she just looks at me, and then, you know, she just looks dazed at me, as if, you know, what, who are you? And why are you bothering me? And then, <laughs> so I said, all right, fine. And then she nothing I said, fine, okay, just finish your turn. She finishes the hour, hands in the tablet, and I was like, okay, so what, what were you learning? What were you doing? And she said, yeah, I was just learning English. So, you know, monosyllabic answers and short answers are part of the course, so she says, I was just learning English. Like, okay, cool, sounds good. So I saw you skipped all these sections, what's that? Oh, well, I know all that stuff. I'm not going to waste my time for that. This is the stuff I don't know, I'm going to focus on. To me, this is deliberate practice. This is what a motivated student looks like. Someone who's identified what they're good at, what they're not good at, and they're focused on fixing pieces that they feel like they're missing, right? So, and by the way, I've seen the contrast in, the vast majority I've seen is the contrast, where we hand out these booklets, we can see the pattern, where the students have filled out the sections that they found easy, They've left the others blank, and if I ask them, have you completed your booklet? The answer is yes, I have completed the booklet. And how is it? Oh, it's easy. You know, and then you go, okay, but why are all these other sections missing? No answer, just silence, right? Uh, and then it's, it's almost like they didn't hear the question. They go, okay, but when, when am I getting the next booklet? So, so the notion is more, I would like it moving forward. It isn't, have I learned this? the critical thinking, the self-evaluation, right? So it's, what this basically told me is that it's actually very easy to measure motivation because we started out in this place where we said, hey, motivation is a very touchy free concept. And up to this point, Shishan has been measuring its performance, right? And we measure performance using the standardized test for us, which many of you are probably familiar with. But put it in a nutshell, at least on the math side, 
The notion is that you should be able to divide a three-digit number by one single-digit number, right? Let's put it in a nutshell, right? And what we found is that you know across Karnataka at least the estate average is thirty percent, right? And what we were getting is something like eighty percent, and we said, oh yeah, that's our key metric. But now as we talk about motivation, what we realize is by just looking at some of these booklets, looking at completion, looking at how many booklets you had to complete, and how much you did voluntarily, because all of this was voluntary, right? By looking at that, we can get a pretty good quantified sense for how much motivation you have as a student. And that's been a real breakthrough for us, right? So if you think about motivation, that's how we're thinking about student motivation. I'm sure you have questions about other aspects of motivation, which we'll talk about offline. Thank you, Vishwan. Okay. Uh, my name is Vijay. Vinay is, I think, the other person on the other side. <laughs> Any case, uh, just to give you a background about PSP, is the story goes back about 31 years since uh, this Thursday when the founder of our organization, who was a chemistry teacher in a local inter college in a district in Anigar, he noticed that the girls' representation in the classes from the villages were dismal at best. We are talking about two students he would see in three years. So he took it upon himself to start a school which is primarily going to focus on trying to get girls into the school system. We are very familiar with the mindset of uh, the guardians uh, with regards to girl children in Uttar Pradesh as Dr. Pante, both of the Pandes explained. So I'm not going to repeat the whole thing. So, uh, so he started it with uh, the very simple vision of getting the girls to school to give them some very basic and skills and knowledge so that they can become self-reliant and do not have to depend on their male counterparts for their life to be driven. If you think about it, the child who is born as a girl child in rural Uttar Pradesh, from the time she is born, she is dependent on the father and the brother and later on she is married off and she is dependent completely on the husband and then later on on the son. So there is a chain of events that go on. So he started this organization uh, there and essentially focused on bringing the girls to school. He started, he started going door by door to the villages, which is a largely agriculture-based uh, environment that we are talking about. It's about two hours, two and a half hours from uh, Delhi. But from a mindset perspective, from a development perspective, very far behind. They still follow the customs of the tribes that we come, up, come from Rajasthan. So early marriages is, is, is very prevalent, though the percentages of this have come down. That vision of getting the girls to a safe place where they can come and learn some kind of skills. But slowly, as uh, Mr. Pandey has found out that you cannot educate or teach a girl anything if she lacks very fundamental aspects of what it is to come to school. So we started to look at the second part, which is nutrition. What can we provide as food? So we started stepping away from education and we started to provide them a very simple impact breakfast for the students. And the second aspect which came, which is there is absolutely no transportation facility for these girls to come from school, from the villages. We are talking about 7 kilometers, 40 kilometers, and we are talking about 0 degree Celsius to 45 degrees Celsius in that part of India. So you will find that on a, a very high temperature day, the school attendance just completely goes down. The student cannot cope up with it. So we had to extend and provide a transportation service. Bank. We have a set of cycles that is provided for students for three kilometer radius for them to come to school and go back. But with the agrarian economy taking a dip, you know, with the farmers, the revenues are not there, they are not able to sustain their own families. We cannot expect them to pay for anything for the school with the student with regard to her education. Books, no. Books are not at all purchased, no copy books, no pencil, no nothing, no uniform. So we had to step in and again provide that aspect, you know, shoes, uniform, jacket, and uh, then we had to provide a solar lantern for the students to 
study at least for a little bit. However, what we have done in our school is we have collected every subsidy that we provide to the attendance. The 90% attendance will get all of these subsidies. We do not want to uh, establish this notion of freeness. That, that is an attitude because they value what you try to provide accordingly. They say because it is free, there is nothing really. We charge a very, very low cost. We are talking about 90 rupees per month. The money that we give back to the guardian is actually around 9,400 per month. So we get 65 and it is about, uh, you know, that amount is given as subsidy. We are okay with that, but we still want their skin in the game to question us, what are you guys doing? So they believe with the 65 rupees that they give, they can step up to the principal and say, how come my student is not doing it? We kind of moved that, but the health and hygiene, the girls during their cycles, you will find a majority of them do not come to school. And in other villages, which are hamlets, which are about 40 kilometers, there is always a senior student who is a pack leader. She is in charge of taking the whole fleet from the villages, from their village to the school. So obviously, when she is going to be having her cycles, the other guardians are then saying that Didi is not going, nobody is going to school, go back home. So we had to provide, we gave them a proper uh, toilet system in the school, top class toilet system. We are providing uh, sanitary napkins, three packages to the girls through a sponsorship organization. So now the girls are more than willing to school during, uh, come during that time. And the health and hygiene, vitamin supplements, anything to, to bring them to school. So after they come to school, what do the, the teachers, like Sarachi said, they are all the products of the very same system that we are trying to transform. And the for-profit schools are operating. The, the for-profit schools are there on one side. We also have a coexisting market of profit-making teachers. Basically to, you know, uh, go after these students to start their own revenue-making scheme. So you have students going to government schools, which is zero cost. But the same teachers will be taking students for tuition at 600 rupees per course or 1200 per course. So the challenge we have is, is in that area where we are trying to give them some skills. So what skills do we give today with the limitation that we have? We operate on the basic premise that the student should have the capability to focus on whatever they are trying to do. Gas card will say, you are doing mathematics, do it well. So we want to bring some focus into whatever they want to do. Second is the decision-making ability. Because of the fact that the entire life is driven by somebody who tells them, Kabu toge, kab so toge, when you are going to do what? They are always looking at the other person saying, what should I do? So we try to bring the notion of decision-making. Make your own decisions. Good or right, make a mistake. That is fun. And the third part is the courage that we will stand by you if you decision, if you decide that this is what you would like to do. Of course, you, you do not want to get married, we step up and we try to support the students. So that is the limited premise of education for the majority of the students. Of course, there are going to be examples even in our area where they are capable of doing excellent work. So the way we have categorized that is in three one is called near things that our students can do with the approval and the permission and the blessing of the family. Government jobs, which is the teacher's job, the railway's jobs, which they try to give posting in your relative group or you know, kind of thing. So there are there is a good interest in that, so we cater to that we call as a close where the students go to places for working girls who have joined a Vrindavan nursing program where the guardians are little bit progressive where they are willing to risk and send the girl outside the community and we stand by and say the girl is going to be good she is not going to catch any of the things that you are worried that she will learn from the you know, other culture. The right 
10 cases of remote winds where two of our students actually are here in the US studying on a one year US government paid program you know, to basically get course in the hospitality management or in computer management and when they go back they, they, they can join a multinational company of some kind and we have students in yoga university in Bangalore uh, learning diploma courses in mechatronics and in computer science, etc. So these are the three categories with which we operate on. And uh, you know, so far it has gone well, and we are able to proudly say that we have over 1,200 students who have left, come to our school and completed 12 years and gone. I do not want to claim that they graduated because I don't know what they graduated in. But I can tell you that these 1,200 came students came, learned the philosophy that hopefully will make them better mothers, you know, better capable students going forward. So the students who go for graduations have increased, meaning further education has increased rather than staying at home. Number of students now raising the hand to go to the close wind schools, close wind jobs is raising. And of course, the number of students who want to come to America, there is a huge demand for that. So, you know, so those are the little background about our organization. Thank you for the excellent introduction. So I actually want to get a quick clarification on how long we should go. I know the original time was 12.15. Shall we go, we started about 10 minutes late. So shall I go at like 12.25? 12.30. 12.30? Okay, okay, so that's good. That leaves us a uh, decent time to go over a few more questions. <laughs> um, so, the one question that we would ask is like, often like most of the ASHA volunteers in this, uh, from in the US, obviously we are not dealing with the day-to-day -day, uh, realities on the ground and you are there, I mean, many of you are there are connected with the people who are doing the work day-to-day. -day. So we don't see many of the challenges that you often do. Uh, seeing things from here, seeing simple, like we can sometimes tell, oh, why is you just do it? But obviously, it's not as simple when it gets to the ground. So maybe a quick um, kind of from your point of view, wherever you are working, uh, what are some of the challenges that you see on a day-to-day -day basis? If you could tell tell us a little more about that, could be challenges with respect to funds or policies, internal policies, dealing with the government, dealing with people. Uh, whatever the challenges you face, like maybe limited to the top few uh, that you can make. So, how about I go with you first? Yeah, yeah, yeah. sure. Hello, everyone. My name is Amit Paribal. Uh, I've been part of the SBS since almost 10 years. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, uh, Sharon's part uh, with respect to the ground level, I mean, we go for NGOs, which is girls' education. So. We mostly face a problem when we go to this nearby village, which is about we support uh, nearby 30 villages. So if they have a sibling, boys and girls in the family, so parents prefer sending boys uh, to the school instead of sending girls because their main motive and the mindset of the people in that area, specifically, area, uh, is uh, why do they educate the girls? Because anyways, girl is going to go out, get married. Uh, Hispanic and they don't have a limited uh, uh, source of income. They are most of a laborer. Uh, so main source of income is agriculture. So that's the main problem. So to encounter that, we usually go to, uh, go to different villages, do some campings, uh, make them aware of what, what the level of education, what we can support it. Like uh, the Jedi has already covered it that uh, we provide different kind of uh, values to the Kids who comes to the school, they come in that they're going to make 90% uh, attendance and uh, their uh, parents come in that uh, uh, the girl will not get, uh, will not get married uh, uh, at least 18 years of age, uh, those things and along with that like uh, solar lighting project and a toilet building project which we have, which, uh, uh, which has understand, uh, I mean, which gives the parents understanding that this is what we are getting it. And once girls' children get educated, seeing the seniors that they are going to a different schools, going to a different places like Bangalore, uh, Noida, or US for different education.
migration programs, they are getting placed in the migration companies, getting jobs, they're earning good salary. So those are the positive things we need to show them to get them. Uh, and the financial part of So, so from a challenge perspective, I can tell you the biggest challenge we have in UP is the systemic challenges. It is, uh, yes, there are challenges with the guardians, there are issues there, but I think those are all small when compared to the systemic problems. What do we mean by systemic problem? Safety is a huge issue for girls in Uttar Pradesh. Meaning, uh, even the three, four kilometers that the girl has to come from her village, okay, the times of the day has to be carefully chosen. And uh, even if she's five minutes late from coming back from school, her father is going to parade her on what happened. They are largely driven by what the society thinks and the society talks. So that to us is, a, is an issue. To the extent even the principal of the school, cannot leave much later than, the, you know, the, as soon as it gets dark, she is not to be in the road. So safety and security is a huge issue for us, which is completely ignored, which is considered as, uh, this is how it happens here. Infrastructure, when I say infrastructure, electricity, there is no electricity. The electricity will come on probably at 4 o'clock in the morning to 6 o'clock in the morning. And everybody turns on their pump sets or everybody, you know, for example, in our school, we fill our water tank at that time. That is the only time that is available. Now we have a few 3 kilowatts, 6 kilowatt solar panels which are there, which we sometimes fall back on to do it. So that is the second. This uh, the transportation facility. The students, I talked about 3 kilometers, 7 kilometers. Now what about this 14 kilometer curve? The government has a law saying that you can only charge one rupee for a student. But the private buses don't stop when they see a pack of students in care, which is about 32 kilometers from our school. So as soon as the students, they just leave them and go. And then even if the students get into the bus, the journey is not a pleasant one. The kind of harassment and the pushing and all of that that goes on. There are, there are teachers who come late consistently and when we have pulled them up saying what is the reason why, she said, sir, I do not want to take that bus. If I take that bus, I will come on time. But the kind of harassment I will go through is not. She goes back home one kilometer and then she comes to catch the next bus. So these are all the systemic problems which exist in an area like ours. You know, government as much as where it operates is, is a great help. But we have found that right now many obstacles are dropped by them rather than help. I tell you that uh, 12 years back we pulled back the government assistance for which we had filed as an organization, which means the salaries will be paid by the organization, but the operations will be done by us. We basically said no because of what we saw happened in the other schools. As soon as that was done, the accountability that we can get from the teachers is lost. Schools are grounds for political lobbying in UP. There is a huge, uh, you know, uh, huge, huge voting population who are all teachers who are corrupt who will work with the government. They will bring politics inside the school. We have the BJP side of the school. We have the Congress side of the school. And they will not come to school, they will fire, they will find some boy in the village, pay him 3,000 rupees to come and sign the register every day on the, you know. Keeping that, so we had to cut, uh, we closed the file as they call it in the UP norm, we closed the file saying we don't want the assistance. Trying to get the funds for this is always challenging, you know, meaning uh, uh, if there is an explosion of NGOs also, in case you are keeping track of how many NGOs have companies entering in India, especially after the CSR law came into the effect. Now you have uh, proxy organizations that have been created by corporate themselves to push their CSR percentages in there. That is the, the, the funding aspect. We are largely driven by individual sponsors. Uh, I can say maybe we have two corporate sponsors who have given us about four lakhs one time, etc. But otherwise, it's largely given by individuals who contribute. So challenge is that 
people from even Noida to come and live and to teach our students is not practical because like I told you the electricity problem, the, their children don't have a good school to go to so they will not come to our area. Uh, and, and it's a practical making enterprise everywhere they look around. And like Maheshji said, that they are looking for certain certainty. If a certain number of years is being spent in a place and you are taking them away from a 200 rupees earning or 200 rupees saving. In your farm, if your daughter works, you are saving 200. If your daughter goes to work in another farm, she is earning 200. So how are you going to place it in front of them? So these are some of the challenges we have in our organization. That was very amazing. Thank you. Um, so, uh, so Shikshan is somewhat in a different context here. I think we've been focused a lot on Karnataka. I think it's been actually very helpful to hear a lot of the UP commentary, uh, particularly because we've been thinking about how should we think about UP. So, thank you for that. Um, now, in, in, in Shikshan's case, I would say, given that our focus is on motivation, on student motivation, a big challenge for us has been how we communicate this concept. Right, particularly to teachers, right? So when because we have full-time employees who visit these schools, and, and they visit these schools once a fortnight. And uh, when they visit the schools, they are basically monitoring the program. They're working with this. What we've, we've created the student leadership body, right? And the student leadership body is the one that's actually driving these programs on a day-to-day -day basis, right? So these guys are just going there to mentor the student leadership body to say how are things going, how can we help you, and so on and so forth. However, from a teacher perspective, what they see is I see an extra pair of hands who can come and potentially teach and give me a free hour, right? And 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 there are a number of reasons for that free hour. So I don't want to necessarily just say, oh, all those free hours are bad, right? So they're, they're, because believe me, government school teachers certainly are not going to have a ton on their plate, right? They're not just used to, to be very clear, they're not just teaching in the school, they're also electoral officers, they get called to be witnesses in court. Like, it's just, just, it just feels like if you cannot find anyone else to do something, you just go grab the local school teacher, right? And so they have a lot on their plate. So I, I, I sympathize with some of that. So regardless, so they see this as, oh, why can't you come and teach, right? Why can't you come and just teach? You're here for half a day. Why don't you just spend the whole day here, teach for a day, and then I can use that to do other things, right? So, but then at the same time, getting them to think, no, look, uh, so that's one thing. And the second piece of it is, okay, we're, you're giving out these stars. Like I told you, we give out these shiny star-shaped badges. So teachers, by default, are doing things like, I want to reward accomplishment. Oh, I asked a question. You got the answer right. I will give you a star. Right? So getting teachers to understand, oh, look, I need you to focus on effort and attempts, not on outcomes, right? I want you to focus on students' input. That has been a bit of a challenge in terms of communicating. But then over time, we've gotten, because these teachers have started to see the value of it and have started to make that transition. But that transition, we always find that there's three times. So we cover, last year, we covered about 3,000 schools. Uh, in the 3,000 government schools. We only cover government schools in rural and semi-urban uh, regions, right? And so last year we were supporting about 3,000 schools or about uh, equal to 300,000 children, right, or 300 children. Uh, this year we are now looking to step in and say, okay, we are going to cover an additional five districts and potentially even the entire Karnataka state. So then as we're looking at that, we're talking about major leapfrogs in how much scale we are going to take on, right? So one of the things we are thinking about is how are we going to communicate these concepts effectively uh, to all of these teachers. So this is a big challenge in our mind, which is how are we going to scale our program and get people to understand it well enough and implement it well enough. And for this, one of the and, and this actually ties into what Asha is actually funding for Shikshana, right? Which is the uh, Sasha has basically been one of the supporters of this technology platform or an app that we've created that we are using to monitor what is going on in the schools and start collecting data back, right? And then this basically, and this way looking at the data, we can sort of start figuring out whether the program is on the right track or someone needs support. The idea is not to go and beat up people. The idea is to figure out who needs support. And because that's the other aspect of the big challenge, when people need support on the ground, they don't raise their hand. Their, their natural default tendency is to say, Okay, whatever, and then just close it. Like, teachers will attend your training, 
they would come, they would try and put it in, in effect in the class, and then they say, oh, okay, I didn't fully understand that, now that I think about it. Okay, never mind. And then you find these pristine kits, right? These, these math kits and science kits, and these are absolutely pristine sitting in the headmaster's cupboard, right? They're, they've never been put out simply because maybe someone tried it once, they ended the training, they got the kit, they came back with it, they, maybe they tried it. And then they thought, mm, maybe that's not quite how it's supposed to work. Then, all right, I'll just put it in. And then they're actually very proud to show it to visitors because it's in such good condition, right? For, but for us, if it's, if it's in good condition, that's a bad sign. So we like to see things in, in use. So one of the things that we're actually now able to do is, and then ironically, this technology platform that we built for, for to monitor our programs, I said, OK, I want to use this statewide to monitor summertime mid-day news. Nothing to do with our program, that's not how we're thinking about it. But then there's enough take up for that kind of monitoring because they're starting to see the value of that data come in and the value of, and they also agree with the mechanism in terms of how that data is collected. Because by the way, there's a lot of garbage in the garbage out for data because people will just submit a bunch of useless data, usually fudged, right? Uh, but again, we have to, in each step of the way, understand why is it being fudged? Like, what are the systemic reasons why people feel compelled to do these kinds? Kinds of things, and and what we found in this case is we is we reinforced to teachers also that we are we are asking for some of this information because we want to understand who needs support. If you basically tell me everything is good in the school, then you're going to get no further input from me. Right? Everything is good, you're good on your own, right? But if you want inputs from us, if you want inputs from and if you want us to raise the issue to the government so that they will give you that input. And then and we have built up that confidence that we can do that, right? Then we say, but for that to happen, you have to tell me what the problem is, right? So then I think so this is one of the ways in which we've been able to get people to support, to supply data, right? And, and hopefully this is something that we can get better at over time. So, if it, so to summarize, I think from a, for us, the big challenge at the moment is how to scale. And, and, and the, the, tech, the tech platform that we've been building with our improvements particularly helps on that one. Thank you again. Again, I think uh, learning from very different perspectives from two very different regions, I think, is very illuminating for many of us. So, uh, I would actually uh, skip one question that I had and move to the last two, which I'll combine together. It's from your perspective, what do you see the role of ASHA as currently, right now, uh, beyond? Funding, if anything, and what can we do better? What are the things where we can be more effective uh, in helping you achieve your mission? So I can start with Amit. Uh, so for the ground level, I mean, uh, the main problem which we face is about uh, teachers, the good teachers coming to that place because it's a remote area. So people from, uh, I mean, with good knowledge, good skill set, which can train our teachers or train our students, give them good quality of education, uh, problem we face. Uh, because the completely remote area, uh, the NGO cannot pay a very high salary. Um, so considering that, uh, if ASHA, with other chapters of ASHA in India, uh, if they're working with other training, uh, teachers training, uh, program or something where they generate the volunteers who can visit our uh, take some uh, summer classes or whenever whatever the possible that's one of the yeah, um, one area where we seldom run problem into but you, you do not have the capacity or the domain expertise to venture into is uh, something that uh, Mahesh had mentioned what they do at the grassroots level which is to uh, appeal to the government persistently uh, protest to get some basic rights that should be done he was talking about getting the rto that is just one format or one form of it we make a visit to the government school we are talking government uh, facility of any kind be it a sales tax reimbursement form or trying to get the register of the students taken care. There is always some portion that they expect for the paperwork to go through. 
our staff being in their capacity in the community do not have the capability to fight will get retribution directly back from the community and they do not want to take sir i didn't sign up for that i signed up to be the principal of the school i am not somebody who's going to go and fight about why the external examiner is asking for 30000 rupees to make a visit okay so 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 i'm hoping that with the work that mahesh is doing whatever at the grassroots level with the government interaction they have had successes with they can assist us in you know taking up some of our cases and trying to get some some work done there for example let us take helpline right the, the notion of the helpline that is prevalent whenever some kind of violence happens on a girl it is only name say in our area okay nobody pursues it uh, the villages is will it they keep it hush hush you do not come to know of what really happened we do tell our students about the help line if some kind of abuse happens but again none of the teachers or anybody in our system capability to go and fight the case of the student so with somebody like mahesh and the organization that asha is running at that level helpful there but that way we can separate ourselves from the from the antagonizing aspect of pursuing such an activist role in the community and focus on what we are good at uh, i will be honest with you i'm going to be a very very bad persuader when it comes to uh, what the government should be doing you know it calls for a certain expertise certain knowledge of how the mechanism works and how to work the apparatus to your advantage and you need somebody there daily who soaked into it to know how to get things done so that is one area i would really like and second like i would say if asha chapters or asha fellows are creating uh, grassroots and you know, motivated fellowships we are looking for such people right now the challenge is we are looking for people who are talented asking for a big paycheck when they come in as a teacher but their motive is also to make money from our students so we are having teachers from noida who are saying i give you 35000 and come to your school but at the same time they are also looking at how they can make tuition money of so the mindset is the key so i think uh, somebody like a fellowship from asha or other chapters where the service oriented nature is there and uh, we can pay the salaries that uh, are probably going to be the 70th percentile of what the private offers and you know we can provide them a place to uh, you know fulfill their personal goals in terms of education transformation yes i have a couple of different perspectives but interestingly they both kind of converge on the same thing um I actually found out about Chick Chinnamas through Asha. Right, so I used to be an Asha volunteer. So I was with Asha DC chapter, and the founder of Chick Chinnamas had come to an Asha conference. So I don't. So this is interesting. The second Asha conference I've attended. Um, so the so for me, Asha is, is actually doing a great job of actually cross pollinating. And as a steward, as a project steward, I actually have the opportunity to visit multiple projects and see the different contexts of it. Right. I think to your earlier point. It's it's you would think it's a bit frustrating. You think this is this is a big problem. Why aren't we just focusing on it, fixing it, and getting on with our lives, right? But surely this must be easier than this. And and I think that coming and seeing all these projects and and going and doing this like this and, and understanding the different contexts to the point where and and by the way, I've also been part of several conversations where you say should we be cutting the funding for this program? You know, are, are we done here? But this this is not this doesn't seem to be going anywhere, etc. etc. Right? But then you start to realize that the context of some of these projects is so widely different that it needs a different framework. You can't just apply one set of metrics and just put it there. Anyway, that's a different composition. So all I'm going to say is that I think one Asha is doing a great job in terms of exposing a number of people to the issues on the ground, and the number and that exposure is important on the project side because then when we come to make the funding pitches. Right. 
Uh, and not just here, because there are ASHA volunteers in, in corporates, including in CSR as well, right? So we go and put it in front of them. They have some appreciation of the problem we're trying to solve. They have some appreciation of what the big challenges are, and that makes it easier to have that conversation, right? So I think that's that's one big advantage I see. And the other big advantage, and I would second what Amit was saying, which is we're definitely very interested in having volunteers also come in and be part of our show, right? And and again, and, and it might be it, so in my case, for example, I took a year and a half, right? That's I so I was in a one and a half year stint and and, and right, I served as the CEO of uh, Shikshana full time the brand. Right. Now that said, there are other roles that are open. So for example, as I said, we're we're investing in tech, so we're interested in folks who can come into development work. Um, some of that can be done remotely, but at the same time, it has to be done in a dedicated way, right? And what I think has been a bit of a challenge in the past is having folks do some part-time work and then it comes to events about, and it, that just becomes hard. Especially now that we're interacting with the government, we have deadlines that are not movable, right? We have to deliver on those deadlines. So it, it would just be useful to have volunteers come in and support us in, in those kinds of projects. Maybe you're, you're focused on management and you can help so that maybe you're a teacher. In which case, we don't actually teach, but there might be there might be work on the program development side. So all of those are areas which I think our can is already ready to deliver on, and I think we could use help on that. That goes beyond the funding side, right? Um, and if you're interested in any of these, please take me offline. Happy to tell you about what we're looking for at the moment, right? Um, the, the, in terms of what ASHA can do better, as having been an ASHA volunteer, like I think I have a bit of a, an insider's view on what ASHA could be doing, but also in, from an external perspective, right? Things are going well, as I mentioned, right? But I think we also need each of us to take the time to understand the nuances, right? I think the, uh, so for example, somebody was talking about, hey, you know, here's a government issue, and here's, here's, here's how we have to interact with government, but then I think you've seconded it. And I kind of get that, but that's, that may be a unique context, right? Because when I look at it from a Karnataka perspective, here, here's what's happened, right? We started working with Vibha to launch what we call an accelerator program, right? And we did this in two districts, and Vibha funded it, right? And then we said, uh, we went and put this in front of the government, and then we said, hey, this is how we want to do this. And the government said, okay, we'll, do, we'll put in half the funding. So the government's then putting in half the funding for two districts. And then we did the, and then as we're doing that, the government, the, the IS Office of the Principal Secretary in this case, is actually coming and pushing us, and are you thinking big enough here? Like, how do we make this go faster? I'm happy with how the results you're delivering, but can we go faster? Right? That's the conversation you want to have, and this person's having it with you, and this person's pushing us, right? It's the other way around, right? And we've had administrators do the same thing. I know when I say administrators, I don't mean the IAS offices, but this, this vast bureaucracy that goes beyond IAS, that, that's actually the rigid function, right? And then that bureaucracy was initially a bit skeptical because we really stepped up our government engagement over the last year and a half. And as we did that, they were a bit skeptical, they weren't sure how to deal with us. You're talking about motivation, what is this motivation thing? And, and I understand, do you have a new textbook for me? Like, that's easier for me to digest, right? Uh, and now we're saying, no, this is just the kind of program. And so getting that engagement going has been very productive because now they're super enthusiastic. They want to, they want to work with us. And starting with the student has also paid off for us because very often the student ends up pushing the teacher. The student ends up pushing the administrator. I'll give examples of students going based on some of the projects we did. They went and pushed the panchayat to do so, to take actions around the school. And believe you me, we gone and pushed that panchayat, you know, uh, president. Nothing would have happened. And and this this small group of students went and met with this person, and, and it got done. Right? And it's just that the, the children have a lot more power in many of these conversations. It does, right? So it, it just sees that the context are different. So I think understanding the nuances and understanding what are the different problems that need to be solved and what are the structured, serious approach to solving these problems at scale. I think that's really essential, right? Versus, uh, because I, as an ASHA DC volunteer, I actually did the survey and said, are we delivering on quality? And, and the, at least the instance at that time was no, or that's not our feeling. Are we delivering in scale? The consensus at that time is no. Like, are you happy? Yes. Hello. Help me understand this. <laughs> you know. So if you're not delivering on quality, you're not delivering on scale. Like, what exactly are we doing here? Right. So I, I think, and, and by the way, I, I agree with all three comments now in retrospect. Right. But then I think that we have to resolve that ambiguity. So what Ashok could be doing better? Come up with that phrase.
framework. I think this is where you have the working sessions on. I think using some of those working sessions to create that framework for yourselves. And then helping us understand what you want to get out of some of these things. And then preparing yourself for scale. Found a funding, for example, that we are looking for. It's like, hey, I want to get to, I need to raise an additional 75 lakhs, right? So we're talking about something in the 100, 120 range. So how do I have that conversation, right? It's not enough to have that conversation with one chapter. Now, if you're going to have that with multiple chapters, what's the scalable approach for us to engage with the project? That's not enough, right? So I think that's, that would go a long way. Thank you. So I will just summarize a little from my point of view, and I hope we'll keep all these comments and take them into our working sessions uh, the rest of today and tomorrow, because I think there's lots of things that we learned from other than today. Uh, quickly, a very few things that I'm going to summarize is what I heard that ASHA uh, roles could be is providing, for example, on the ground, helping out, uh, whether uh, providing their expertise, uh, helping with the organization, doing, uh, connecting with teachers training and other skills. We heard about uh, ASHA helping general issues that enables the organization to be most effective. So maybe working with the government at some levels to say either reduce corruption or work being on taking some of those activist quote unquote activist roles to uh, deliver on the for example the policies that already exist such so making them ground like our service was doing and then uh, also about uh, what Chala mentioned earlier also internally talking looking inward and looking at Asha learning the nuances and all of because we all tend to see the world through our own filters or our own lives so it's very important for us to kind of step outside and kind of see the different nuances and different that exists in different parts of india india is very wide and very diverse and we all know that one thing that works in one place is not going to work in another place exactly the same way so all of these things are great and i hope we will take this uh, to our working session and we have about 11 minutes so let's go and do questions. And it looks like we already have some questions. Yep. Can you guys hear me okay? Sometimes it just doesn't work. Oh, I, I can. Okay, so we'll have to get you out for lunch quickly. So I've chosen some few questions. Um, I'll try to summarize it one for each organization. And then the criteria is anybody who had a daughter attached to student. <laughs> <laughs> Just to get your questions next time, so you need to. Um, it all goes to Asha, by the way, not for me. But. So, one for um, Sikshana. So, I'm combining a couple of questions here. Um, it's great that you can measure motivation. Um, can you help us understand what you're doing to improve the students that are, who are lacking the motivation? And then, in terms of combining it with the education, um, like tablet-based education, what kind of educational materials you're using to customize it to improve the motivation? Yeah. So there, are, I think you said quite correct. You don't want to in that question. Um, so, uh, so in terms of what we do to drive motivation levels, I think that's the part I wanted to. Do. Um, kind of they are obviously I could have done a better job. So there is no silver bullet for motivation, right? I wish there were. Uh, a pill that I could give to every student as they walked in and send them motivated, right? And in the absence of that, right, what we do is we take a very life cycle kind of approach. This is this is a very marketing approach. If you think about motivating students, it's a marketing exercise, right? So how do I get the student into school? So that's motivation level number one. And this is where we do these rewards and incentives, right? Uh, but obviously, just like you're, you're talking about a retail outlet, right? You, you, you've got to get these promotions, but then once this, once this customer is in your store, you can't just keep on giving away more free money. That's not the point. So how do you then create the experience where the student needs to keep coming back? So the stickiness here comes from those peer networks that we're building in the school. So the peer network ironically does two things. Ironically, but it does things. Uh, the first thing it does is it, it uh, because I've got my friends in school, I want to keep going to school. So then this this is a, this is a very uh, common theme that we've heard and been recognized in education journals in multiple locations, and I'm happy to share references. 
But then in addition to that, it also builds a safe zone for the student in the class. So very when you have to learn, and if you visit a school and you just go and ask a question in the class, you'll find that there will always be a few students sitting somewhere who are trying their level best to just delve under the table. They don't want to make eye contact, they want to be invisible, right? Um, and the thing is that that's because they don't feel safe, right? They feel like if you ask them something and they get it wrong, or you interact and they get it wrong in some way, then it's going to mock them, right? So having the peer network increases their confidence to take those risks that are essential in the learning experience, right? So that's the second part of the motivation journey is the peer network. And we do this by creating these student leaderships and what we call peer teaching exercises. The peer teaching exercises happened before school. That's actually what we meant the school to monitor, by the way. Which is we wanted to see our kids actually coming to school, you know, before uh, school starts, right? And it goes into the, then you talked about the teaching learning practices, what are we leveraging? The point is that we are actually agnostic to teaching learning matters, so if, or neutral to them. So if you want, if you, as long as they make some, some kind of sense, it's not scalable at the moment to launch a tablet program statewide or countrywide, and, and we are very optimistic that we will get to that stage. But in the meantime, what we've created are these booklets, right? And what we've said is we take booklets are all open source. We haven't created the content. We've taken the content from other open source locations. And we pull it together. What we've done is we've collated, curated, and organized. That's how we put it, right? And we put it so that you have the same concept being introduced in multiple ways. Uh, and then having a connection across the uh, across the, the lessons that the child is learning and then linking it back to the learning maps which allows them to see the progress that they're making and what's missing and what's next, do their own goal setting. So I think you talked about decision making, which I thought was a very interesting thing. I think this is something we should think about as an area for improvement. Right? But as you can see, this is our framework, so our focus is not on the content. We actually want to leverage third party content, or we're always on the lookout to see whose content we could leverage. Right? Um, and and yeah, we actually see ourselves as a uh, almost as a marketing slash injection agency, right? So if you, if there are, and, and by the way, we have done this with a few others, which is to say, um, and AIF has, has put in some of their programs. Uh, we've also had this, you know, in the English app I was talking to you about, I think it was Hello English, right? So the point is we're happy to introduce all of these and then see what the uptake is. Our goal is to drive adoption for this. If we find the kids are picking it up, adopting, and I'm doing this, and then we find that across all schools, no one's adopting it, and we drop it. We'll say, no, there is no interest. If we find that there's interest in some schools, but not in others, then we try to see how to improve the marketing and, and the adoption rates of those schools. So it's all about motivation, not on the teaching learning methods. Okay. Great, thank you. The other question is for um, BSPES. So, um, but first, Vijay or Ahmed. First of all, apologies. Okay. I named your name, I, it was Vijay clearly, yeah. but maybe I. On my head, oh, I didn't. I had reading disabilities this morning, so um, sorry for that. Um, so the question—it's a two-part question again. So how are you actually motivating the girls? I know you spoke about it a lot in terms of encouraging, and as you also covered as part of the challenges. But the question specifically is around: Do you see working with male volunteers poses a problem? And how do you recruit more female volunteers who can go and encourage and recruit more girls to come? So that's part one. And then as part of that, once you recruit and train them, do you see improvement and change They going back to the villages and then handling with issues such as improve their agriculture, anything, any other issues in the village? So it's a two-part question if you can answer that. Um, actually, we have had good success with both categories, both male and female. Honestly, I have not seen any uh, difference in that aspect. However, what I have uh, seen is um, they might not be academically you know, on the higher side, but people who have a concept or the context of where they are operating deliver a lot of value to us in a very short time. And what we have found out is exceptionally talented people. The context of the place, they have actually deteriorated or created more problems for us. So, so the way we take is when somebody says, I would like to come and do volunteer work in your organization, one of the first thing we do is we do what is called UBI, UBIization. Uh, 
contextualize where are you what do you do right there are certain norms there uh, in a in a community because these girls and these fathers are sitting and watching these are the people who are interacting with my daughter and news catches very fast whether good news reaches them or not bad news reaches very quickly and uh, even to the extent if two volunteers uh, they cannot stay together in a guest house that we offer you know we have the separate guest house for males separate guest house for females uh, when um, people who are from even cities like Bangalore, right, they, they want to go around in the evening, stroll, and the safety is an issue, so we have to tell them, you know, curtail them. Sometimes it's seen as a limitation. What do you mean for seven hours? What am I going to do? There is no TV, there is no electricity, I can't go here, I can't go there. We have done that, and we have found the right with the value they have given to us. It's tremendous. The, uh, the the role models that they are able to present in front of the students, the students are saying, how do you want to be, they have said the volunteer's name, I want to be like her, what do you want to do, I want to do what she is doing. Everything she does is so nice, I mean, if she talks to well, she presents herself well, it could be a, a, an American who has now volunteered in our school, uh, other than her uh, color, you will see that everything that she does is a typical UP person. She wears the proper dress, she is absolutely fine with eating what is available, a staple there. She understands the norm. So you want somebody who just go on with the system and just, you know, get things done. And the impact is good. What about the students? What have they done? Um, even our students, when they go to work for a customer service job in Delhi, or go all the way out to yoga university to learn about Patanjali Yoga Sutra. When they come back, they come back as much more poised and much more focused kids. And uh, they are able to help their father sell more batata vada at the stall also. Nice. If they have a mela that is there and there is this girl by name Deepika who is studying learn and learn program in Dr. Reddy Laboratory in Himachal Pradesh. And she came back for vacation and her father keeps a tea shop inside a villa. She ran it in a systematic way because she's, she's thinking like the doctor at the laboratory saying, Pitaji, you should keep it like this, like this, like this, like this. This is how. So the father is saying, Kom se kum kuch to si kya hai. We need to learn something and come. That has made more, saving more money. Why are you using so much sugar? This much sugar is enough, you know, for, for example, things like that, you know. So all of that comes back. Um, uh, what is the right way to, uh, for example, uh, the students ask questions now about uh, asking the father, you sold the potato for 2 rupees. The gram potato is for 10 rupees in the store. How come we are not getting that money? So she has learned the economies of things, so she has mind this. The father is saying, what do you mean? Yes, that is what the seller bought it for. You know, 10, 100 grams is for 10 rupees, and you are seeing per kilogram, you are getting 2 kgs. So we are seeing that, you know, in a, in a good That's way. Good. Other yeah. Well, thank you. Again, all the questions will be answered. We are trying to compile it, and then send it to the panelist, and then we'll get the answers for you for sure. Because again, we're all trying to get session times for everybody and then get you on the right place. Let's hear it for the panel, including the moderator. Uh, I'd like to thank Harsha for giving us uh, such an opportunity and platform. Uh, obviously, with the presence of somebody itself, you know, we cannot come up to the height of what he has done, um, but it is uh, all this pleasure. There was one question which was there, which I wanted to address quickly, which was, what is the long-term goal of your organization? Actually, the long-term goal of our organization is to shut it down. Because we know something is going to make the government schools come up to the level that we don't have to do this anymore. And we want to take the position of entrepreneurial money, when we want to give the money, we want to give the money to students who are coming out of government schools to start their own businesses. Away from education. We want to shut it down basically. So that's something I want to try. Thank you that's very great. much. Thank you. I'd like to welcome our regent, uh, our own national.
much as we have a volunteer to give some small digital certificates. Thank you. 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 Thank you.